Are you sick of those damn political crusaders? The anti-libertarian libertarian party? Sick of the violence and coercion that makes up the status servile society with seemingly no escape? Are you looking for real practical solutions to increase your personal freedom and your invulnerability to coercion? If so, kick off your shoes, come inside the polyethylene A tent, and let's talk Vanu. Join your hosts, Shane and Kyle, as they further explore this freedom strategy and develop it into the modern day. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast. Welcome to the Bonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from Acapulco, Mexico. Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, this podcast and everything found on the website is covered by a BIPCOT no government license, allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more by visiting BIPCOT.org. So, um, yeah, since uh, coming, uh, I guess, let me see here, I gotta redo my introduction now that uh, we're not live on YouTube, unfortunately. Uh, so for those who are going to watch live on YouTube, unfortunately, the upload speeds weren't going to cooperate, so instead we're just going to do a uh, pre-recorded video, and uh, I'll get to do some, and I'll actually get to do some video editing for it and then I'll get it tossed up on uh, on fascist tube and DTube and all those other locations so um, today I'm joined by John and Lily um, I heard their story a few months ago when I was uh, I guess a couple months ago when I uh, you know figured uh, you know I guess figured I was coming here to Acapulco um, but I've been excited to meet them ever since uh, they are self liberators entrepreneurs uh, country shoppers and in my opinion of uh, uh, there's a lot more we can learn there's a lot that we can learn from them in uh, our individual pursuits of Vani so without further ado uh, you guys welcome to the uh, the Vani podcast it's uh, certainly uh, great to have you and it's been uh, great hanging out with you guys for the past month or so oh, thanks for having us on yeah thank you hey no problem no problem so um, yeah I'm not sure how familiar my audience is with you um, so I guess I'll start with uh, some introductions and you guys can divvy it up however you want to um, but uh, yeah I guess some, some introductions uh, who who are you and uh, what do you do um, I'm Lily Lily Forrester also Lily Divine on Steam it um, I'm one half of the On The Run duo, and that's not just a catchphrase. We came here almost three years ago, essentially fleeing the U.S. for cannabis crimes um, with the intent to make a new life here in Acapulco and see what we could do, and we've managed to do that for the most part, thanks to the dynamic city and the people that fill it. Um, I do all sorts of things, everything from the Anarchoforco project we've been working on to glass blowing to cooking to hanging out with my chickens very good and I'm John of the John and Lily on the run duo um, I am currently dready John gold on steam it um, just got on there recently so check me out there uh, I've been down here helping start anarcha Forco. I've been doing different forms of entrepreneurship including helping Lily start her glass factory um, doing all forms of agorism that we've done down here, helping our attempts at homesteading down here, even though it's been very different than what we were used to in the Already Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. We well, guys certainly have uh, <clears throat> certainly have a lot going on, and uh, I guess from hearing your story in other places and also talking to you, uh, it kind of seems like the uh, alternative lifestyles and uh, the agorism started before Acapulco, though. So I guess let's go back to to, to that point. Um, I guess uh, uh, you know. I guess tell us a bit about uh, your background going into anarchism, uh, anarchism, agorism, and uh, kind of uh, you know what led uh, up to uh, moving to Acapulco. I guess the easiest jumping point would probably be when we uh, realized we were anarchists, so I'll let Lily go first on this one. Well, my story actually starts a lot earlier because I was raised by hippie parents that were against the government and the establishment, but in the same breath they'd also take food stamps, so there was a lot of cognitive dissonance. I went to college, I got into politics. And then I realized that politics weren't changing anything. The group that I thought was going to change the world was just really getting together, together to party and get sponsored to do so. And it wasn't changing anything. And 
that time I became an anarchist, I dropped out of college, and one thing led to another. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, for me, I had just gotten out of prison. I had kind of always had like a libertarian leanings, kind of anti-authoritarian view of the world, but I didn't really have a strong philosophical core to that. I didn't really, it was more of an instinct than a real understanding of why I felt the way I did. Um, but my whole process of going to prison kind of set me on the fast track towards anarchy. My lawyer ended up recommending a couple good books that were uh, important to setting me on that process. The Prince really? by Machiavelli, uh, How to Win wow. Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, there's another one, but I, that I can never remember that one. I wasn't as important to me. I don't even think they ended up letting that one through the censor or whatever, something like that. But <laughs> Very good. Very good. So I guess the anti-authoritarian anti bent, uh, uh, you know, very early on for both of you. Um, I guess uh, when did you, uh, you know, what was kind of the, the impetus for kind of, uh, um, you're talking about some of your, I guess, uh, alternative lifestyles, like, you know, living in Detroit and, you know, ghettos and things like that. I mean, what, uh, what kind of sparked, um, you know, what, what led you guys to decide to, you know, try out those lifestyles? What made them appealing to you? Well, like I had said, I'd been just gotten out of prison and my situation is a little unique and I was sent to prison in the United States without ever being convicted of a crime. Uh, I've never really met anybody or heard of anybody that has had that happen to him but I ended up doing several months in prison and being processed into the system and being treated like a prisoner the whole time and then being called back to court and having my whole case dismissed so I don't really know what that was all about like but the judge kind of gave me a lecture like uh, you will respect my authority type of thing and then went on a, uh, a little tirade saying the worst part about my situation is the taxpayers of Oklahoma will never recover the cost of incarceration of me because I'm going to leave his state. And I was like, oh, that's a very interesting outlook on things. And it kind of right. made me realize that some people have a really warped view of the world and maybe statism isn't actually correct. And then showed up to college and was hanging around some libertarians and all of a sudden we're reading things like uh, Rothbard and mm -hmm. Atlas Shrugged and one thing leads to another we're no longer libertarians and we both look at each other presidents of uh, organizations on campus and we're like well, we're anarchists why are we why are we presidents <laughs> right and like I had mentioned my life was kind of always a little unconventional from the beginning I was raised by quote-unquote hippies which I mean they were essentially what came after the hippie movement got hijacked in the 60s, which is a long story, but I was involved in like a counter way of living, so to speak, before any of this. So when it came into, you know, everything from going off the grid to growing cannabis to all of it, that shit just wasn't that much of a stretch for me considering what I had already experienced before I was 10. So I was like, okay. There's better ways to do that, I guess. <laughs> so within, within a year of us uh, becoming anarchists, we had decided to start going much more off the grid than we currently were. We had debanked around 2012. Um, we had started living in crypto around 2011, um, end of 2011. In mid-2012, we debanked, and then by around 2013, we had moved off grid and were living a much more primitive uh, lifestyle just to kind of see if it was something we could do and what that would mean and well, learn those skills. Yeah. yeah, we were living off of like a cheap smartphone, basic internet plan, you know, occasional Google search at most and right. keeping track of crypto price, sending a uh, crypto, you know. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting, very interesting. So I want to talk about, because uh, I, I guess back in 2015, when uh, this would have been a few months after I became an anarchist, um, I you know wanted to become unbanked. Uh, it, I took steps towards that, but never got the uh, you know the, the whole way through. But you, you guys have been unbanked since you said 2012, and you've been living off crypto. Um, I guess uh, how <clears throat> how difficult is it you know living unbanked in a foreign country? I mean, what are some of the obstacles that uh, uh, that come with that? Yeah, I actually find it a little bit easier here than it may have been in the States. I guess that depends on like how plugged you are, plugged in you are to your local economy. But as a foreigner here in, in Mexico in particular, they have 
fairly lax cryptocurrency rules in a fairly supported market. So especially buying crypto is very easier if you have pesos and if you have a Mexican friend or various other ways, it's pretty easy to get Mexican or crypto into Mexican pesos here. So right, and and you were saying that like uh, at the oxos, like at the gas stations, you can actually uh, yeah, you, you know, can buy, buy crypto cryptocurrency. At, That's like, crazy. Yeah. Almost every major <laughs> real retailer here through Bit. So. Yeah, you deposit yeah. the money into your Bitso account and then buy on the Bitso market, and there you go. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty cool. Maybe it's uh, uh, you know I'm thinking with I guess the the ease of buying and selling cryptocurrency here. Maybe it, it maybe it would be easier to live unbanked, you know, on crypto here than in the states. Because um, mm-hmm. in the states, without a bank account, it's uh, it's it's hard to hard to do anything. Um, like even even my best alternative um, right now, other than you know decentralized exchanges, is something called Veerwalks, and it just ties directly into PayPal. Like there's no, they don't ask for a driver's license or a social security number or anything like that. And obviously, it's tied to a bank account, but um, but that's an even better solution, um, I think. So yeah, that's uh, uh, that's that's certainly interesting. So I guess let's let's get back to your guys' story a little bit. So um, you uh, you know pursued these alternative lifestyles. You became anarchists. And uh, you were doing stuff with uh, cannabis, and I guess uh, you caught word uh, somehow that you guys were, were going to be uh, charged with some some victimless crimes, and uh, you decided you made a plan to uh, to leave. So why don't we uh, pick it up from there? Yeah, uh, essentially, after our first attempt at going off grid, uh, we realized that it was a smart move to go and do it in the city, very close to a Walmart and a Home Depot and all that. But it was probably the wrong city. We would be better off doing it in Detroit, and that's where we went to next to to make another attempt at it. But in Detroit, there was actually a community of people doing very similar things to what we were doing, rather than us being the only oddballs out. So, but the neighborhood in Detroit was probably a little bit rougher than the area we were in in Cleveland. It's actually one of the most notorious areas of Detroit and a lot of rap songs and stuff about being the place to go to get crack and heroin and whatnot. Yeah, um, us moving to Detroit was amazing and I miss it. It's one of the few places I miss. Um, But us going on the run was really a series of events. We were just trying to live in peace with our use of the cannabis plant we had the wrong things on us at the wrong time and got fucked over and charged with a bunch of crimes and they tried to make us out to be a um flight risk and all sorts of other things yeah essentially we got caught um with a large amount of already blown trim like of marijuana so like when you're trimming it there's leftover material It's used generally in hash making and edible making and things like that. This material had already been processed for the most part, and we had that and some butane on us, and uh, essentially that was enough for us to be charged with five felonies and essentially be facing possibility of 25 plus years. And because neither of us could really afford to just pay all the money to essentially bribe the judges, and to bribe the other people in power um it was basically our only defense was to leave and so that's that's what we did and we determined that acapulco was a great starting spot right yeah yeah that's uh that's a lot that's a a lot of years uh that certainly is and i mean yeah it's expensive it'd be expensive to fight that and uh you know obviously uh uh you know in the injustice system it's heavily weighted against you so um yeah, that's uh, certainly certainly unfortunate to hear. So you chose Acapulco, and I think what's most what's most interesting or unique about your story is, um, you know, a lot of expats come here, you know, kind of uh, where they're semi-retired and they, you know, kind of come here for leisure. Um, but uh, um, I lost my uh, my train of thought where I was uh, yeah, where I was going with that. I remember that's not good. That's not good. Um, but uh, oh yeah, I know I know what it was. Um, yeah, a lot of expats come here with uh, with you know a lot of money. You guys didn't come here with uh, with very much money, um, you know, when you were uh, you know making the trip down here. So I guess kind of speak to your financial situation, uh, you know, coming down here and, and how little uh, you know money it took you to get started here. Well, we were flat broke before we even crossed the border, and we basically begged our way through California. It was mostly Mexicans that helped us and a Bitcoin donation that was at the perfect time. And then we were in debt getting here because our friend helped us yeah. and he paid for us to get here. Yeah, we had about $50 in cash when we crossed the border, but luckily we had met up with a friend in the San Diego area and he was kind of inspired by, 
he watched us cross and kind of followed us in his own vehicle and you know the whole thing kind of inspired him and within a day or two when he realized we hadn't been arrested crossing the border he decided he was going to come down with us and we ended up meeting up in uh, Rocky Point or Porto Pernascas area and driving the rest of the way together so he ended up loaning us the rest of the money to get to Acapulco and essentially our living expenses for the first month month and a half while we got established and we immediately started out with Agoras businesses uh, Lily you know immediately started hustling and yeah I was hustling cooking food for people every night and that was literally to pay for our own food costs so we could afford to eat every night and slowly it built up over time and we were able to actually support ourselves yeah we immediately pro started providing tourist services and plugging ourselves into the local economy and trying to provide value in any way we could Right. Yeah. And that's uh, I, I guess that's uh, that's another thing I kind of want uh, I kind of want to speak to is uh, I mean, yeah, like with, with uh, you know, your are bank. Like I said, your unbanking situation is very unique because for uh, like for me and for for others, um, you know, we can sell digital things online. And I mean, you can, you can do that with crypto, too. But um, I guess uh, it's just uh, <clears throat> makes things, uh, I guess, a little more interesting, you know, being a foreigner yeah. and, uh, you know, have, having to, you know, grind and, and, you know, figure out how to how to survive. Yeah, and, most uh, people you know, come food. here, if they're not retired, they have an online job or they get an online job and those online jobs require banks to be able to accept the money or PayPal, which requires the bank. So it's like, yeah, that leaves a lot of the easy money out of out of the question for us so in a lot of ways it is part of why we have to hustle but we'd also prefer hustling than working an online job anyway so sure sure if you are the type of person that's just trying to you know work that job and enjoy paradise you can get an online job making five to ten dollars an hour and that's enough money to live a really high class lifestyle down here you know yeah yeah and that kind of is. is excluded for us all that steady work you know because we need a bank account to be able to do stuff like that sure sure yeah yeah but i, I suppose there, there are some advantages to that too i think it's uh, the more principled approach um it's something i've been working it's just so damn hard um to to, to survive without it um I, I certainly think it's the more principled approach you know c cutting all those ties to uh you know the first from uh, institutions banking or whatever so um I, I i certainly respect it and uh um, at some point you know maybe if i if i can get my online stuff to be mostly crypto then maybe maybe it'd be possible to swing it but uh, i don't know <laughs> we're very glad we started taking the steps that we did before we we ended up in the situation that we did because it made us have many more choices and much easier to be able to think of the possibilities that were available to us whereas if we were still completely in the banking system and whatnot it wouldn't have seemed like as much of a possibility yeah when you go on the run like one of the things you do wonder is like how is it all going to work but when you've already been unbanked and detached from that system it's like all right well i'm just gonna make bitcoin and we were our plan was to go to detroit make a bunch of money buy a bunch of bitcoin and <laughs> use that to live off of getting to acapulco that's not how it worked out but that was our plan is to have crypto right yeah yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So, um, I guess uh, I, let's let's talk more about uh, what you guys have done. Uh, you know, I guess uh, entrepreneurially. So, um, you've mentioned uh, some of the. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, you've mentioned some of the uh, some of the ones that you've uh, uh, you started, but uh, um, you guys did pretty well on Steam it for some time too, right? Yeah, there's there's been brief periods where we've done pretty well on Steam it. That's the thing is it kind of ebbs and flows and. There are a couple good couple month pushes, but for the most part, Steam it has been a lot of work to keep it at what it is. It's sure. Still much it, it's still much better than Facebook, yeah. you know, because they don't pay you anything. But don't think it's gonna be easy money, and you're just gonna post some easy stuff and be a rich person overnight. You know, it definitely takes some work to be even a mediocre player in the Steam it world right now. Right. Yeah. It's not a summer of 2016. Or yeah, anything you put up there got a bunch. Yeah, that was yeah. So, yeah, it's it's certainly uh um, I, it's it's you know additional additional income. I don't know if it's necessarily uh, reliable, but um you know it's it's there. Uh, it's certainly there. So, um let me see here. Uh, so you guys mentioned you've been you've done some some homesteading too. Um, I guess uh, tell us a bit about what you did in the states, and then also you've got some uh, some stuff happening here that you've been uh, that you've been test uh, you know testing uh testing out. So. 
Well, uh, our first major project in the States was essentially us uh, reclaiming some land from the city that they decided to reclaim some, from some private owners. So they were essentially stealing land all over this uh, area that we were living, bulldozing houses, turning it into just vacant area. And we decided that it would be a better use for at least a season to take a few of those lots and turn them into a big uh, experimental garden. And we. Yeah, and it definitely uh, inspired some people and proved like a bunch of the neighbors thought it wasn't even possible to grow food there. And we grew a lot of food and uh, realized there was a lot of food to be taken advantage of in the neighborhood, like mulberry trees and old apple trees and stuff like that. And learned a lot from that experience, had a lot of fun dipping our toes and, uh, you know, fighting, fighting the government and lost a lot of money in that process, you know, it was probably a expensive learning experience but generally those are where you get the best lessons so sure and sure from that point we kind of moved to the detroit area where we spent like four months kind of preparing to farm there before uh the state ended up interrupting our plans and we ended up having to change our plans to go on the run but since getting here since getting here we got Basically, we haven't done much for gardening. Admittedly, we've had tomatoes and stuff like that, a couple good gardens, but our main homesteading venture here has been chickens and ducks, and we previously had quail, and we've got a few rabbits, and it was hard at best because we're on top of a mountain, and <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing, but we still have chickens and ducks. It's been extremely difficult to grow pretty much any plants that we're used to here. Tomatoes have done all right, but within a few months you get some crazy pest pressure on them. Other mm. than that, it's been pretty difficult to grow anything. So we've resorted to the animals even before we were on the carnivoristic diet that we're on now. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. I mean, I, I like the chickens a lot more than I expected. I like doing all of that a lot more than I expected, but it was also a lot of work, and it's a lot people don't realize. Like, people don't consider having to break up chicken fights and chase them around the mountain and stuff. That's just not what most people think of when they're like, oh, yay, eggs! It's a lot more than eggs. There's a lot more than just planting the seeds and putting some water on them because then ants will come and take your plant and walk away with it, you know. it's It's like that. It's not easy to just kind of <laughs> stick some seeds in the ground like where we're from. Right. Everything eats everything in the jungle. Yeah, everything eats everything here, and that's not an exaggeration. Right. So, so I guess for those who, because I, I did not, I had no idea what to expect when I came here. I knew like there was going to be beaches and such, like and that was kind of the obvious thing, but I, I wasn't really quite sure what to expect. But um, so you guys here are at the, uh, I guess at the top of a mountain. And it's like 10 degrees, 5, 10 degrees cooler than it is down, uh, you know, like in Bonfield, I'd say. Um, seems to be more of a breeze. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty pretty far up, pretty far up. So, um, I guess, uh, let me see here. Uh, is there anything else you guys want to talk about with homes uh, with uh, in regards to homesteading or uh, anything, uh, you know, related to uh, Acapulco and, uh, you know, growing stuff or anything. Yeah, a word of advice, because everybody I talk to says that they want to come here and start a farm because it grows year-round. Just remember there are bugs. Cold climates are nice for a reason. And food is also extremely cheap here, so that really takes away your motivation to do all that hard labor when there's really high-quality food abundantly available around you for like a tenth or a quarter of the price you're used to paying in the states right yeah yeah that's uh that's certainly certainly a good point um so i, I guess uh, let's let's also talk about too you you mentioned the cost for uh the cost for food i mean yeah everything is is basically cheaper here as, as far as i've found out um but yeah like i said uh, you guys are up here on a cl on a cliff uh, you know up on the mountain with a really fantastic view of the bay um and you know, the ocean and all of that um i guess uh um, if you guys don't mind sharing i mean what do you pay i mean there's a there's a, a big room here um where i guess kind of the kitchen and there's uh, yeah the kitchen area some storage rooms and then, uh, i guess it's a couple it's a couple bedroom, bedrooms so so i guess uh what what um what are you what are you paying to live here yeah we have a three bedroom three bath in a rural neighborhood and like uh it's 
kind of a developing neighborhood right on the edge of the city of Acapulco before you get into the suburbs. Um, we pay about 300 US dollars a month plus electricity and water and stuff on top of that. But all together we live here for less than 500 USD a month and then add food on top of that. So, Right. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, certainly doesn't certainly it doesn't take uh, doesn't take much to live here. So, um, I guess let's go ahead and move on to the last subject here. And uh, you guys, uh, I think, have both alluded to it. But uh, Anarcha Forco, um, I guess uh, um, this is another uh, venture that you guys set out on. I think last year. Uh, so tell us a bit about uh, Anarcha Forco and uh, why you guys decided to uh, start uh, your own, uh, I guess, uh, freedom festival here in Acapulco. It was a long brewing idea for both of us when we originally showed up here in 2016 for Anarchapoco. We had a great time, we loved a lot about it, but one thing that really kind of stuck with us and rubbed us wrong, didn't sit well with us, is it felt a lot like being in college lectures and having one person in charge and you were supposed to absorb the information rather than being an exchange. We weren't like on an equal footing as anarchists necessarily. And we thought that there might be room to grow or change that format. And at the time, it just kind of was a feeling. And over the next uh, two years, it kind of developed and had other people give us feedback and stuff. And eventually formed into last year when we threw the first Anarcha Forco. Yeah, well, our, we had two really big goals in mind when we forked. The first was to bring the anarchists back to Acapulco Bay, because that's one of the complaints we had was Anarchapulco left Acapulco. It went to a suburb, which is pretty close, but it's in a beautiful but isolated resort with nothing around it, and the food at the resort's pretty expensive, not much cheaper than the U.S. It's not what people think of when they come to Acapulco. It's very different. And then the other reason was we wanted to just to decentralize the conference structure because we didn't necessarily like the idea as anarchists as having somebody make a list of who they thought were important as anarchists to put on a stage and have them talk well we kind of give that power back to the people who are participating and are like if you want to speak you have to do the work and it'll be awesome if you do the work but it's not up to us to schedule that it's up to you um, and it worked last year. A lot of people get kind of put off by this idea because they all ask what what we're supposed to do. Sorry. Um, yeah, they all get put off by what we're supposed to do, but at the end of the day, you're supposed to do what you want to do. So that's what Anarcha Fork is about. Right, right. So, so the way that I understand it is uh, rather than, uh, um, a, uh, I guess, a master schedule um, being put out, basically people, once they get their ticket, they can go on to, uh, you know, onto the website and they can post an event and then they have to promote it and get people to come there. Yeah, uh, the events the, will display immediately. There's, there's no, I have to approve it before it displays. So when you put that event up, it displays. And events can be open format, they can be parties. We encourage you to think outside the box, workshops, classes. The best things last year were the things that were interactive. It wasn't the speeches. It wasn't where you were sitting there listening to something that somebody's lectured already 30 times on YouTube. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's uh, um, a really great thing. I mean, I've, like I've I've been to uh, the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest. Uh, I guess this will be my I guess next year will be my fifth fifth time. I've been to Anarchon, which was very much, um, you know, there was a schedule with speakers, but it was very much an anarchist festival. Nothing really, nothing on the schedule happened. Um, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's certainly an interesting style, and uh, I I'm looking forward to, the, the to, nice to giving it a shot. <laughs> The nice thing about a dynamic schedule is it changes constantly, and I forget where I was going with that. Um, yeah, uh, with our schedule, like we're not necessarily like having a goal of being disorganized. We hope people manage to get to a level of organization through this, but our goal is just not be able to be a corruptible element in this. Like we don't want people that, oh, I don't like John and Lily, so they're not going to put on a good conference. It's not like that. This isn't our conference in that way. This is whoever is buying a tickets conference in that way. And the audience is deciding what's important, what they want to listen to. It's a, an agora or a market of ideas in that way. And something we found is like when you 
give the power of the schedule to the participants, they stick to the schedule way better. <laughs> when you're not telling them to get out of bed to see their favorite act at 8 in the morning, they're there. And they're, they they show up on time to all the things they want to see, and there are great crowds. Like, people thought it wasn't going to work last year, but once we were in the thick of it, like it worked like a well-oiled machine, even with the dysfunction we were having. So it's kind of like... There can be order, it just has to be done the right way. Right, right. Yeah, very good. And people can go purchase their tickets now at uh, anarchaforco.com. Uh, you guys have, uh, um, you're selling hotel rooms currently as well, right? Yeah, through the Hotel Copacabana, which is where the conference is going to be held this year in general. Um, but we also have a deal for cheaper rates. We have three different packages. Um, something to note is for what you would spend on one Anarchapulco ticket, you can get an all-inclusive package with Anarcha Forco with the hotel room and the ticket and everything for just about what you would spend. So it's a much cheaper option, and that all-inclusive comes with food and drinks. So that would literally be everything included, the Anarcha Forco experience ready to go. Right. Right. Very good, very good. So uh, um, I guess uh, um, for... Uh, you know the the big names. Uh, you know, like or maybe not even the big names, but uh, who's uh, who's already committed to uh, um, to to coming and putting on uh, you know a workshop or presentation. Uh, so far, some of our very impactful people are people like Larkin Rose, Amanda Rashwitz, uh, Dan Dix, Dan, Danny Sessom, uh, Ben Swan, um, uh, Jit, Jit from Lieberland. Yeah, the president of Liberland, Jit. Uh, I'm not even going to try and butcher his last name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there will be Kenny and Erica from last year, which Kenny is a great example because he's part of why last year was amazing. Yeah, Kenny from Kenny's Conscious Kitchen. He was probably the most important element of making last year happen other than us. And if it wasn't for him, last year probably wouldn't have happened. Thank you a lot, Kenny, and we're glad to see you again this year. Yes, very, very looking forward to that. Um, if you're interested in what's on the schedule already, there's only three events, and that's just because it's what people have planned so far. There's a lot more in the works, just not on the calendar. I added a cal uh, carnivore talk, so I'm going to be talking about how, you know, the carnivore diet essentially saved me. Um, my friend is doing a talk on a decentralized app she's really passionate about, which is essentially an uncensorable Wikipedia, and she's going to mm -hmm. do a workshop on everything about that with a fun thing at the end and then the third thing that i'm really excited for is um our friend from last year who came who was total badass flynn johnson is doing how i built my dream home out of a pile of dirt and if nice. you look at the event on the f website that home is pretty awesome it's definitely gonna be a talk worth going to yeah, and awesome. there's also a bunch of events that we know are happening that just haven't been put on the calendar yet because people are busy this time of year, got things going on, like Larkin has the candles in the dark going on for Anarcha Forco, but it is not yet on the calendar. You can't yet buy your tickets for it, but it is for sure happening. He's already made Facebook announcements about it, just saying he's busy, and there's plenty of other things like that. Expect to see the many things in the coming days. Check the calendar. Constantly for updates. Website changes constantly. Yep. Right. Right. Very good. Very good. And yeah, for uh, for listeners, the Volney podcast, uh, I'll be there. I haven't put mine up yet. I probably won't put it up for for another month, just because uh, I have to figure out when I'm uh, uh, when I'm gonna uh, you know be back. And I'm not good at planning ahead like that, so I might uh, you know delay on that uh, just a moment. It'll be some sort of Volney workshop. I'm not really. Not really sure yet. I've only done presentations. I haven't done a, a workshop, so I know how that could uh, that could be done. But there's uh, there's some way. I'm sure Henson and I can figure out some way to do a Vani workshop. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, if you guys are interested in getting tickets, uh, I would uh, say feel free to use my affiliate link. I'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Vani Fork. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash uh, Vanu Fork. So. He, he also has the coupon code Vanu, and if you use that, you get 15% off your ticket. You can use that with or without his link. So just Vanu and the co coupon code. Oh, yeah, we're uh, forgetting to mention altogether that one of the best parts about Anarcha Forco is its affiliate program. Once you've bought a ticket, you become an affiliate, and at that point, you can sell tickets as an affiliate, and you get about 49% of every ticket you sell in crypto back to you. So. It's a great way to cover your expenses or make a little money, you know. It's a one, we think it's probably our best feature of Anarcha Forco. 
Yeah, sell a couple few tickets and your trip here is covered. Yeah, for the most part. So yeah, that's cer certainly uh, certainly and uh, certainly awesome. And yeah, so I, I was I, I uh, so the coupon code Vani, very good, very good. So um, I guess uh, any uh, anything else you'd like to leave the uh, the listeners with? And uh, I guess if not, uh, feel free to to plug away where people can uh, can find your work. Um. Yeah, anarchoforco.com is constantly changing. It's constantly being updated with news, with new speakers, new events. That website's a tool, so use it. Um, that's what I have to say. We look forward to seeing all of you at Anarchoforco. Uh, don't be your guys' biggest controller. Let's make this world an anarchist world. Let's not hold ourselves back. Cheers, yeah, cheers to that. So, um, so yeah, where can people find you on Steemit, uh, on all the uh, on fascist book, all those all those places? I'm um, I'm Lily Divine on Steemit, Lily Forrester on fascist books. Pretty easy to find me. Lily Divine on Smoke.io. We also have an Anarchoforco Steemit page. And yeah, if you want to contact us directly and you can't figure it out, still we can be contacted through the website and we'll respond to any of our uh, contact form submissions. Currently, the best place to get a hold of me is Dreddy John Galt on Instagram or Steepshot slash Steemit. Uh, I'm also on Facebook as John Galton. All right, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, for taking a half hour or so and uh, telling us about your story and uh, Anarch Forco and all sort and all the really awesome things that you're you're doing. Um, and yeah, like I said in the beginning, as far as uh, for uh, you know potential venuans, I mean, uh, coming. I didn't come down here with much money either. Uh, to be completely honest, I've been down here for like a month and a half, and I haven't, uh, or I will be, you know, by the end of it, you know, a month and a half. And I didn't come down here with much money. So um, I mean, for for. I think uh, their, their, you know, their their story uh, can really illuminate the fact that uh, you can you can ha you can find freedom now. You can have freedom uh, and you know a lifestyle change. And you just uh, have to be willing to take it. Right, right. It doesn't require uh, you know as I thought uh, you know it required all sorts of investment capital into a into a van for van nomadism. Uh, you know that I had to wait to be free. Um, you know, for yeah, for forget about that. Uh, you know, there there are uh, pockets of freedom in in the world now, and I think uh, uh, there are a lot of places uh, in Acapulco, uh, in Bonfil, and you know, the surrounding areas that uh, are, are certainly um, great places to be free. If we wouldn't have hesitated, we would have left the country with 123 Bitcoin, and we wouldn't have been on the run. Don't be like us. <laughs> yeah, that hurts. That hurts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. So, um, thank you guys so much for watching. Again, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Vanu Fork, or just use uh, coupon code Vanu um, for the discount. Um, and uh, yeah, make sure to uh, subscribe here to the YouTube channel for uh, for you know future live streams. Uh, I wish this one could have been a live stream, but uh, oh well, it'll uh, go out uh, in the same the same app as anyways. So, um, VanuPodcast.com, Patreon.com forward slash Vanu if you want to support the uh, support the podcast. And uh, I think that's uh, that's all we have for you today. Uh, Thanks, and uh, we will talk soon. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.